Hello, my name is Mohammed Faridi from Destination Ministry. Today I have with me Sam Shamoon from Answering Islam, and we're going to discuss about very important topics in regard of Islam and answering Muslim objection to Christianity. I hope you enjoy. Sam, would you tell us why is it important to be prepared to give an answer to everybody that has an objection? Yeah, it would be my pleasure. Because as Christians who love the Lord Jesus Christ, we seek to honor Him. And the way we honor Him is to obey His commands. Mm -hmm. So one of the commands our Lord gave to the apostles, and not only to them, but to everyone who follows the example of the apostles, is to make disciples of all nations. Mm -hmm. That's found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Mm -hmm. And He then says, to teach them everything that I've commanded you. Now, <clears throat> we live in a world in which most people do not believe in the Christian faith and have objections against the truth of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we need to be prepared to answer those objections in order to take them captive for the glory of Jesus Christ. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that's <clears throat> written by the Apostle Peter under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, the blessed apostle exhorts every Christian, mm -hmm. not just the elders or the deacons or the evangelists, every Christian who's born of the Spirit who belongs to Jesus and loves the Lord. He commands them to sanctify Jesus Christ as Lord in their hearts. And then he says, always be prepared. He doesn't say when you feel like it. Always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that's within you. That word defense is where we get the word apologetics. Because mm -hmm. if you go back to the Greek, you'll see it's apologia. So there Peter is commanding all Christians to be an apologist, defending the truth of Christianity and answering the objections that people have against submitting to Jesus' Lordship. So this is why we need to do that, because we're commanded by the Spirit. Thank you. Uh, the question is now, if a Muslim... <laughs> walks to you yes and you want to share the faith with them what kind of a questions or objections would, would they have yes yeah, so that's an excellent question because as Christians we need to reach this group mm -hmm. there's about 1.8 billion Muslims and they need the gospel of Jesus Christ even though they think they worship the same God revealed in Jesus Christ we know they don't now unfortunately because the Quran presents objections against the Christian faith Muslims will have some issues with believing in Christianity. So they have mm -hmm. some objections that every Christian must know how to answer. For example, Muslims are offended by the belief in the Trinity, that you have one God and three persons. To them, that's three gods. So they'll tell you, how do you believe in one God when you have three gods, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Or how do you believe that Jesus is God who became flesh? Are you saying that God came out of a woman's a womb? To them, that's highly offensive. And they also have issues with the authority of Scripture. How can we trust your Bible? How do we know the Bible has been preserved? And how can we trust it as a sure source of guidance that comes from the true God? So these are the objections, some of many, that Christians need to be ready to answer because these are the questions that will come up. Thank you. Whenever I quote the Scripture, the Bible, to the Muslims, they always say, your Bible is corrupt. How can we refute that? I follow the example of the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, 28. Paul would actually quote the very sources mm -hmm. that the particular group he was reaching believed in to prove his point. Mm -hmm. Therefore, since Muslims mean the Quran, I will appeal to the Quran to prove that as Muslims who follow the Quran, they must accept the authority of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to qualify <clears throat> your use of the Quran because a Muslim can tell you, well, you don't believe the Quran, why are you quoting it? And my response is, I'm quoting it because you believe it and I'm sh showing you what your book tells you about my book. Mm -hmm. The simple fact of the matter is that in the Quran, Muslims are told to confirm the scriptures in the possession of the Jews and Christians at the time of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of passages in the Quran, and I'll just give one as an example. Chapter 2, verses 40 to 43, <clears throat> and then chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. There we are told that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are the revelations of God, and that the Quran confirms that these scriptures are authoritative and have never been changed. So if a Muslim is faithful to the Quran, he has to accept the Bible. But if he accepts the Bible, he has to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Thank you. One of the objections Muslims have for Christianity, how can God have a son? Yes. Well, my response would be, why can't he have a son? What are you assuming about sonship that makes it impossible for God to have a son? Mm -hmm. So I would ask that question. Now, depending on the response, that would influence how I would address the objection. Now, if they tell me, well, he can't have a son because he has no consort. In other words, the only way that God can have a son is if he has intercourse with a female. Mm -hmm. That objection actually comes from the Quran. It comes from chapter 6, verse 101 of the Quran, where it says, Wonderful originator of the heavens and the earth. 
How can he have a son seeing he has no consort? So the assumption there is that Allah or God can only have a son through sexual intercourse. Now I would say, well, if that's the case, you affirm the virginal conception and birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because no Muslim can be a Muslim unless he believes that Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's actually in the Quran. My question is, how could Mary have a son when she had no consort? Now the response of the Muslim will be, well, that's easy for God. So wait a minute. It's easy for God to cause a virgin to have a son without having sex, but God can't have a son unless he has sex. Do you see the, the problem with that logic? Yes. So why can't God have a son? That is correct. Uh, do Christians worship three God or one God? Which one is it? <clears throat> yeah, uh, the Muslims assume because we believe that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They say, do the math, one plus one plus one, that's three. Well, in one sense, they are three. They're three persons, but they are not three gods. They're three persons who exist as one God. Now, if we're going to play the game of math, I would say, well, what's one times one times one? One. What's one divided by one divided by one? It is one. And one to the third power is still one. So I don't want to reduce God to a mathematical equation because mm -hmm. both the Bible and the Quran say that God is greater than all creation, unlike anything in creation. Mm -hmm. So why can't God still be one God but exist as three persons? Why can't He be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and still be one God? Mm -hmm. If you say, well, look at you, you're one being and one person, but you're not God and God is not you. To say that God can only be one God if He's one person, it's to like Him to His creation, which both in the Bible and in the Quran is blasphemy. The way I would describe the Trinity to the Muslim is, I would adopt the model of the Blessed Apostle Paul. He mm -hmm. goes, he became all things to all men, mm -hmm. that he might win some to Christ. That's mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 and 23. And what he means there in that passage is, think as a Muslim thinks, and try to communicate the truth of the gospel that makes sense to them. So to say Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's foreign language to them. So how do I communicate the Trinity? Mm -hmm. I say God, His eternal word, and His eternal spirit. See, now a Muslim can't object because even in the Quran, the Quran presents a trinity of sorts. It's not the trinity of the Bible because I don't believe the God of the Quran is a God of the Bible. But the Quran does affirm a trinity of sorts in that you have Allah, His eternal word, and His ruh, His spirit. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying God exists with His word eternally and His spirit. That word became flesh, the person of Jesus Christ. Now, in Islamic teaching, the word of God became a book, the Quran. So what they say about the Quran is what we say about Jesus. They say the eternal word became a book. We say the eternal word became flesh. So now if your God can still be one, even though he exists with his eternal word that you believe became a book and his spirit, yet he's still one God, then why would you say that Trinitarians, as a Christian, my God can't be one God if he is God, his eternal word become flesh and his spirit. Why the inconsistency? So we have the same view. Even though our view is not identical, it's still similar enough to teach that the Trinity is not a violation of monotheism, that there's one God. Thank you. In the Bible, did Jesus ever say, I'm God, worship me? That's a common objection that Muslims will bring up to try to convince us that Jesus never claimed to be God because he's not. Now, the simple answer is no. Jesus never came out and said in those exact words, I am God or worship me. However, if that's the reason to reject the deity of Christ, that Christ is God in the flesh, then this argument proves too much. <clears throat> because I like to ask the Muslim, do you believe Jesus is the Christ? They'll say yes. The virgin born son of Mary? Of course. Is he the word of God sent down to Mary and a spirit from him? They have to say yes to all that because in the Quran, in chapter 4, verse 171, it says that Jesus is the Christ, the son of Mary, <clears throat> the word of God, and a spirit from him. My challenge to them is, show me where Jesus said that. Show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I am the Christ. Can't find it, he never said it. Show me where he says, he's the word of God sent down to Mary. Can't find it, he never said it. Show me where he says, he's a spirit from God. You can't find it, he never said it. So if I use your logic, you cannot believe Jesus is the Christ, the word of God, a spirit from him, because he never said it. Now, which Muslim would accept that logic? They'll say, well, he doesn't have to say it. God said in the Quran. Well, thank you. In my scripture, God the Father himself bears witness that Jesus is God Almighty and the Lord of heaven and earth. So if you will still accept that Jesus is all these things, even though Jesus didn't say it, then why do you insist that I have to show you Jesus saying those things for you to accept it? Isn't the testimony of God the Father good enough that Jesus is God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the sovereign Lord of all creation? And that's found in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 to 12. So let's be consistent. Thank you.
My question is, why God has to kill someone else in behalf of my sins? Yes. See, even the way you frame the question is wrong. No one said God had to kill someone in order for him to forgive your sins, because that's not what we teach. We teach that in the person of Jesus Christ, God himself, out of his infinite love, mm -hmm. came down to pay the debt of sin. See, now, the way you frame the question can impact your reaction or your response to the truth of the gospel. See, that response right there is an emotional response. In other words, you're, you're trying to evoke an image mm -hmm. of the cross that's horrendous. Who in their right mind would kill their son for some stranger? But that's not the, the message of the gospel. Mm -hmm. The message of the gospel is that the Creator Himself, in His infinite love, came down to the earth to pay the debt of sin. Now, what is the debt of sin? The Bible clearly says, the soul that sins shall die, mm -hmm. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Now, God knows that mankind cannot do enough good <clears throat> to merit salvation, mm -hmm. nor can they pay the debt of sin, because every time you try to pay for one sin, you commit another. Mm -hmm. So that means now you're in a situation in which you'll never be able to be good enough, and you can never pay the debt of sin. Mm -hmm. The only one who can pay your debt of sin is God. So God chose in the person of Christ to come down and pay the debt of sin. And since the debt of sin is death, He voluntarily chose to become man to die for you in order to save you from His wrath and then to give you the gift of salvation. Now, would we consider that something horrendous or would we see that as an amazing display of love mm -hmm. that I, in my love for you, will do something for you that you cannot do in order to be saved from wrath? I think that's good news. Yes. When I was a Muslim, I always thought Christians, they have created a very immoral societies in the West. Why should I follow Christ? Because we make a distinction between people who claim to be Christian, Christians and what the Bible actually teaches. Mm -hmm. So not every, everyone in the West is a Christian. You may have people who claim to be Christian but could care less about the Bible, could care less about what Jesus Christ teaches. Mm -hmm. So I don't judge Christianity by its followers. I judge Christianity on the basis of the Scriptures. So does the scriptures teach that because Jesus died for you, now you have a license to be immoral? That is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible quite clearly teaches from beginning to end that God demands that you repent, turn away from your sin, turn towards Christ in faith, and then seek to live a life that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Lord himself says, <clears throat> if, you go to Ma uh, sorry, if you go to John 14, 23 to 24, he says, He who loves me will obey my word. Mm -hmm. He who loves me will keep my commandments. And the commandments of Scripture is, Be holy as the Lord God is holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16 says that. Mm -hmm. You must be holy, for the Lord your God is holy. Mm -hmm. In Romans 6, 16 to 23, the blessed apostle Paul says that at one time you, you gave your members of your body to sin. You sin no more. Because now you offer your, the members of your body in righteousness. Because now you are slaves of righteousness, slaves of God, no longer slaves of sin. So the Bible is quite clear. If you're a true Christian, you will do all you can in the power of the Holy Spirit not to live immorally, but godly in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. Sam, there's a tough question. They say that Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible and Jesus claimed that there is a prophet coming after him. Is that the truth? The reason why Muslims believe that is because the Quran does say that there is a prophecy of an illiterate prophet found in the Torah and the Gospel. Mm -hmm. That's chapter 7, verse 157 of the Quran. And then in chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran, it has Jesus. And we need to be careful when we say Jesus says in the Quran because we don't believe the Quran contains the actual words of Jesus or anyone else mm -hmm. that's mentioned in the Bible. But again, according to the Quran, Jesus went around telling the children of Israel that a messenger would come after him whose name is Ahmed. Mm -hmm. So because Muslims believe the Quran is true and it records the actual statements mm -hmm. of the prophets of the Bible, including Jesus, they expect to find prophecies of Muhammad in the Bible, and they think they found at least two such prophecies. One in Deuteronomy 18, a prophet like Moses, and then when Jesus announced the coming of the Comforter mm -hmm. in John chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. A careful reading of the context of those passages <clears throat> will clearly show that these cannot be prophecies of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Because first and foremost, let's go to the, to the prophecy of the Comforter. In those very chapters, Jesus claims to be the unique Son of God, mm -hmm. claims to be, to be the one that the Father has given authority over all flesh, the one who will give eternal life to everyone, and that God is His Father, all of which Muhammad contradicts. Muhammad says his God is a father to no one. 
Muhammad says Jesus is not the Son of God. How then could that be a prophecy of Muhammad who contradicts the very message of Jesus in those very passages? The simple answer to the question is, Muhammad is not prophesied as a true prophet in the Bible. But the Bible does say he is an antichrist because he denies that God is the Father and Jesus is the Son. And according to 1 John 2, 22 to 23, that makes him the antichrist. Thank you. Sam, uh, when I was in Middle East, I never heard that Muslims and Christians worshiping the same God. Yeah. But when I came to the West, to America, I have, I have heard a lot of Christians and Muslims claim that they are worshiping the same God. Are we doing that? <clears throat> well, as far as the Quran is concerned, the Quran does make the claim that Allah, the Arabic term for God, mm -hmm. the God of Muhammad is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. Now, I can make that claim. Just because you claim it doesn't make it true. So, is Allah of the Quran Yahweh God of the Bible? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. And the reason why is because according to our scriptures, if you read from Genesis to Revelation, the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is triune. Mm -hmm. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Eternal Father is the Eternal Word who became flesh, Jesus Christ, and His Eternal Spirit. Now, if you ask a Muslim, is your Allah Father, Son, Holy Spirit? That's blasphemy. So even a Muslim, <clears throat> once, once confronted with what Christians actually believe, that their God is triune, a Muslim himself will tell you that's not my God. Because my God is not the Father of Jesus, Jesus is not Allah in the flesh, and they'll tell you the Holy Spirit is not Allah, but Angel Gabriel. Even mm -hmm. though that's not taught in the Quran, that's what they, they're taught by their scholars. So the simple answer is, how can all of the Quran be Yahweh God of the Bible if Yahweh is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Allah is not? So no, they cannot be the same God. Thank you. Sam, the question is, how Allah introduced Himself in the Quran? Well, there are many descriptions of Allah in the Quran, some of which are similar to what the Bible says about God, mm -hmm. says about Jesus Christ. Now, I want to emphasize, just because there may be similar things said about Allah and the God of the Bible, that doesn't mean they're the same. Mm -hmm. Similarities do not prove they're the same God, because you have to look at the major differences. Mm -hmm. There are things said about Allah of the Quran that clearly prove He cannot be the God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I'll just give one example. Now again, the audience would have to have some familiar, uh, familiarity with the Arabic. Mm -hmm. Now, glory to God, there are resources to help them in that area. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Allah says about Himself in the Quran, and He says this more than one time, in chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 54, it says that he is the best of all deceivers, the best of all schemers, the best of all connivers. The Arabic phrase is khayrun makirin. Mm -hmm. That word makir, if you look at any Arabic lexical source, means someone who is a shyster, a conniver, mm -hmm. a trickster, a deceiver. There is no way that a Christian could ever say of his God that his God is the best of all deceivers. Because according to the Bible, that's a description of Satan, not the God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, for Allah to say that he's the best of all deceivers, that means that the Allah of Muhammad is actually Satan in disguise. Because the Bible says Satan is the one who deceives the whole world, mm -hmm. not the God revealed in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Sam, would you tell us what Quran teaches about Jesus? Let's start with the similarities, but emphasizing that just because the Quran says things similar to what the Bible says about Jesus doesn't mean that the Islamic Jesus is the true Jesus of history, the Jesus revealed in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Because Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians 11 that people will come with another Jesus. Do not put up with that's it because right. that's a satanic mm -hmm. deception. So for the record, the Jesus of the Quran is a counterfeit Jesus to deceive people from the real Jesus. Mm -hmm. With that said, Muslims do think that they have the same Jesus that we, we believe in. So let's talk about some of those similarities, things that the Quran says about Jesus that are similar to what we believe. Mm -hmm. Both Muslims and Christians must believe that Jesus was conceived to and born from the Virgin Mary. In fact, Mary is the only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran. The Quran even says she's the greatest woman that Allah created. Mm -hmm. That's in chapter 3, verse 42 of the Quran. Allah preferred her above all women of all time. She mm -hmm. is the greatest woman. Mm -hmm. And we know why, because of her son. Her son makes her great. So Mary is <clears throat> the greatest woman that Allah created or God created. She gave birth to Jesus while a virgin. Jesus is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. He's also called the Word of God or the Word of Allah, the Arabic term for God. <clears throat> and a spirit from Him. He was a miracle worker. He raised the dead, give sight to the blind. Mm -hmm. And the Quran says that Allah took Jesus physically, bodily to Himself, so that Jesus ascended to be with God, which in Arabic again is called Allah. And according to Islamic tradition, Jesus will return as a just judge 
to kill the Antichrist and rule the world for at least 40 years. Mm. Now, these are some of the similar things, but let's talk about the differences. Jesus is not God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. That's blasphemy in Islam. He is not the Son of God. That's blasphemy in Islam. He wasn't killed nor crucified. Chapter 4, verse 157 says, Jesus wasn't crucified. So there's the denial of Christ's death on the cross for our sins right there in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Even though he's coming back, he's not coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In Islamic tradition, he's coming back as a Muslim mm -hmm. who will rule the world according to Islamic law, which we call Sharia, and will eventually die and be buried and then be raised with Muhammad to face Allah in judgment. So these are the similarities and differences, but the differences outweigh the similarities. They're not the same Jesus. Thank you. Sam, would you tell us today that why Islam is so confusing? When I read some part of the Quran, it's, te it is telling there's no compulsion in religion, but other parts it says, no, you have to kill the non-believers. Yes. Why do you have certain places in the Quran in which it seems to teach tolerance and peaceful coexistence, mm -hmm. but then there are other parts in which Muslims are commanded to attack unbelievers until they became Muslim, or in, the, or, or in the case of Jews and Christians, pay a sum of money as a sign of them being humiliated and debased by the Muslims. Like a protection tax? Yes, mm -hmm. the term in the, used in the Quran is jizya, mm -hmm. and that is the money that a Jew and Christian must pay mm -hmm. if he wants to retain his religious identity, but that payment is a sign that Muslims have debased him, mm -hmm. humiliated him, subjugated, subjugated him. And that's found in chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran. So why the contradiction? Because the Quran has two parts. A part that's called the Meccan <clears throat> period and the Medinan period. And I don't want to confuse our audience, but these are things they need to learn to more effectively witness the Muslims. Mm -hmm. For the first 13 years of Muhammad's life, he was living in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, and he was outnumbered by the unbelievers. In that period, he knew he couldn't attack them because they were too numerous and they would vanquish him. Mm -hmm. They would pretty much destroy him and his movement. So th those verses were composed in that period where he's talking about to you, your religion, to me, my religion, no compulsion, you know, you know God will settle on the day of judgment, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, to each his own. But then he migrated to Medina and he becomes the head of a state. Now he has an army. Now he has warriors who are willing to kill and be killed for Allah and his messenger. Mm -hmm. So now the tone changes. It goes from, to you, your religion, to now, listen, you either become Muslim, if you're an idolater, or we kill you, or in the case of Jews and Christians, if you don't want to become a Muslim, pay the sum of money as a sign that Islam has conquered you, subjugated you, mm -hmm. and humiliated you. That's why you have these contradictions in the Quran. Sam, would you tell us why we have four Gospels? According to the scriptures, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is settled. So God, in his wisdom and providence, made sure that he didn't give us one account of the life of Jesus, but four accounts inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because now we have four witnesses to the life of Jesus. So that's first and foremost, because God is <clears throat> meeting the demands of his very law, where he says, you cannot accept the testimony of a single individual, two or three at least. So he gave you four to solidify the case of who Jesus is. That's that's. The first reason. The second reason is because you have <clears throat> these different writers approaching the story of Jesus from four different perspectives to give us a more complete picture of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. If you have one testimony, you have one perspective. But when you have four, now you have four different perspectives inspired by the same Spirit so that you can see Jesus from four different angles. So we get a more complete picture of who Jesus is. So that one writer will emphasize one aspect, another writer will emphasize another mm -hmm. aspect. So these are four pieces of the same puzzle that when we bring it together, you see the masterpiece that That's Jesus right. is God Almighty in the flesh, the Savior of the world. That's right. Thank you. Sam, did Jesus abolish the law of Moses? No, he didn't abolish it because our Lord says in Matthew 5, 17, 18, he didn't come to abolish but fulfill. But what does it mean to fulfill? Mm -hmm. That's the real question. Fulfillment doesn't simply mean that Jesus came to obey the commands as given by Moses. <clears throat> I'm not saying he broke those commands. What I'm saying is fulfillment has a much deeper, richer meaning in the context of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. By fulfilling, Jesus meant he came to do all that the law and the prophets said Messiah would do. And he also came to perfect and complete the very spirit and essence of the law and the prophets. That's why if you read Matthew 5 where he says, Think not, I've come to abolish the law. I did not come to abolish but fulfill. He explains what he means. He brings out the true essence, this true spirit of the law. For example, it says, <clears throat> You have been told that you shouldn't murder someone. But I tell you, 
that if someone has hate in his heart towards his brother, he has murdered him. So notice what he's doing here. He's bringing out the very essence and the heart of what the law and the prophets mm -hmm. truly mean. Mm -hmm. And so it's his fulfillment of the law in the sense of his interpretation of what the law and the prophets mean and his fulfilling all the promises that point to him. So he didn't abolish, he fulfilled. But fulfilling means more than just obeying. Fulfilling means that he completes it because it all points to him. He fulfills all the promises because all the promises are yes and amen in him. And he brings out the true meaning of the law and the prophets. Thanks, Sam. Sam, why was the crucifixion necessary? The crucifixion was necessary in order for God to be perfectly just and righteous and well, as well as loving and compassionate. And what do I mean by that? If God simply forgives you for breaking the law, that means God is more loving than just. But if he punishes you for every infraction against his holy commands, mm -hmm. then that means he's more just and holy than loving. So how can God be loving and just at the same time without compromising either one of those characteristics? Because if he simply forgives you for violating the law without demanding that the justice of the law be met, that means he's much more loving than holy. But if he punishes you, for the slightest infraction against the law, that means he's much more just than loving. So how can God be both perfectly loving and just? The answer is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. Because at the cross, God's justice is satisfied and his love is perfectly displayed. And what do I mean? Now when you turn to God and ask him to forgive you for your sins, God can forgive you without compromising the just demands of the law for punishment. Because Christ took your punishment. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a very crude analogy because it's not what Jesus did, but it's an analogy to help you understand mm -hmm. my point. You go before a judge and you have a fine of $500. Now the judge in his mercy can pardon you. So he pardons your fine, but then what he does, he steps off his judgment seat, takes off his robe, and then he pays the fine for you because it turns out the judge was your father. So as a judge, he passed sentence. Right? You owe this fine, but I pardon you. But as your father, he pays the debt of that fine in order to maintain the just demands of the law. That's what God did in the person of Jesus Christ. As judge, you are guilty of sin and therefore deserving of death. But as a father, I forgive you. And I, in the person of Jesus Christ, my son, will pay the debt for you so that the demands of the law have not been compromised. That's why the cross. That's why the crucifixion. Sam, thank you very much. This was very enlightening, and I want to thank you for watching. You can contact us for more information or invite us. You'll be blessed. <laughs>